This is a video for the assembly of a FOB GC 2.0 using a FOB 2.0.5 motherboard, our uh, custom high sensitivity star paddles, and a Kadano uh, C stick cable with FOB vision. I'm starting here with an OEM Nintendo GCC and I'm going to be removing parts from it. So first I take the motherboard out. And I begin removing parts, such as the stick caps. Next, I desolder the rumble motor. And I remove the rumble bracket. Some people prefer to just reuse the original trigger paddles, but I will not be reusing them. Instead, at this point, what I'll be doing is I'll be desoldering the potentiometers and removing the stick boxes. Uh, you don't need to do this, but I like to have the potentiometers available in case people who need work on their GCCs need new potentiometers. Make sure to keep your tin, your tip tinned on your soldering iron. And now I'll be removing the stick box. and I will pry the potentiometers off and put them elsewhere for safekeeping. Next, I like to stow the screws back in the stick box so that they do not get loose, get lost. Do not screw them all the way in because they're not supposed to go all the way in. They stop at about the motherboard thickness away. Next I will do the C-stick. It's generally a better idea to take out the stick box screws before desoldering, but I just forgot last time. This means that you can't accidentally melt the stick box by touching the screw with your soldering iron. Of course, if you are not desoldering the old potentiometers, this is not an issue at all. Don't even worry about it. Just pry the potentiometers off and uh, unscrew the stick box. Set the stick boxes aside for now. You will be using them shortly. Next up, I will be desoldering the GameCube cable. Many people have trouble with this, and there's a some people have a special soldering iron that's wide enough to melt all these at once. Uh, 
I do not, and I will be showing you instead my trick for doing it with a narrow soldering iron. So the key here is instead of removing solder, you add a lot of extra solder. And this improves heat conduction. And then what you do is you just go back and forth across these while gently pulling on the wires. Don't pull too hard, but as you go back and forth, the connector will begin to rock and the pins will move out bit by bit until it's free. Nice and quick, very easy. And then I like to touch these up to make sure that they're narrow because sometimes otherwise they will not fit into the fob motherboard's holes. So now I'll just check that they fit, and they do. And I'll set the cable aside. The final thing I'll do on this is I will remove the Z button and the trigger potentiometers. So I'll just desolder these. There's one potentiometer. Here's the next. Dang it. Here's the second potentiometer. So these potentiometers, um, let's see if I can get a light up here. If you can see inside them, there's carbon material that you can, that is used to determine the position of the slider. The slider has little uh, metal contacts that go back and forth. And if you can see grooves in the carbon material that goes all the way down to the plastic, you should not use these potentiometers and you should replace them with fresh ones, which you can buy from Kadano. I will simply set those aside for now. Now I will decide the Z button. Whoever assembled this controller put a lot of solder on, a little more than I usually find. Always keep your tip tinned with fresh solder when you're not using it. Now I've got my Z button. And now I can just discard the original motherboard. And now I'll clean off my workspace. And the next step is to do prep work on the stick boxes. So the stick boxes have pegs that we need to mount magnets to. And I'll be using these 3D printed magnet holders. Uh, you can get the designs for the magnet holders either printed by JLC. Those files are on the GitHub, or you can find uh, adjustable designs for uh, FDM printing that you can get on the FOB GCC GitHub in the 3D printing channel. So one thing I like to do to ensure uh, quality bonds for the magnet holders is I will clean them with alcohol and then I will scratch 
the sides of the pegs using a, a little pick. This will add surface area and grip for the uh, super glue that I'll be using to glue it on to grab. Otherwise, the plastic is very slick and they won't necessarily stay. Okay, now I've scratched those up, and I will mount my magnet holders. Make sure that the magnets are in the down orientation relative to uh, the stick box. Let me show you this. You want the hole for the magnet to be below the axis of rotation. If you're printing these yourself, it can be a little tough to get a good fit, but uh, you should adjust the parameters in the OpenSCAD file that we provide, and uh, and that'll let you adjust the size of the openings so that they fit well. Sometimes I find it's helpful to stick a screwdriver into these to open them up just a little bit when it doesn't like to get onto the clear peg. There, now all our magnet holders are in place on the stick boxes, and I will be adding a dab of super glue to each, and then attaching magnets. So here's my technique for the magnets. I, I have a long string. and I will press the magnet into the magnet holder like this. But first, super glue. Be very, very gentle when adding super glue because you do not want to apply too much. Close up your super glue bottle and then begin inserting the magnets. I like to take the little bit of excess super glue and rub it around. Make sure that the peg is covered in super glue inside. Because that holds it in place. Now I'll set these aside for the super glue to cure. 
Don't put them too close together or they will stick together. Next, I will begin uh, soldering parts for the, for the new Bob motherboard. The motherboard first will have to be separated. These are called mouse bites and you simply break it across them using your bare hands. Now at this point, however, it's helpful to grab the mouse bites using pliers and break them off. Similarly, with the star trigger paddles, I break them in half with my hands, and then the last bit I break off using pliers. Now, what I'll do is I'll prep four roughly one and a half inch long pieces of uh, wire that I will use for the trigger paddles. Some people like to use the original wires, but I always like to use fresh wires. I'm using a 26 gauge stranded wire with PVC insulation from McMaster. It's really cheap and it does the job well. Um, I strip the ends with my wire stripper and give it a twist as I pull the insulation off to keep them neatly twisted together. You need four of these wires because each trigger paddle uses two wires. Next step is very important. You want to pre-tin the stripped ends of the wires. So I dip the ends in flux paste, and then I take my soldering iron, I put clean solder on the ends, and then I touch the soldering iron to the flux paste on the tips of the wires and it fully wets out the wire with fresh solder. This is very important for getting easy soldering later on when it's hard to apply good pressure. In this case I use no clean flux paste. No clean flux leaves a less corrosive residue that is also non-conductive uh, so you don't have to remove it, but it's always a good idea to remove it. So I'll be removing it later with alcohol and a wipe. Now I'm going to apply alcohol to clean these ends.
Now I'll begin the soldering of the motherboard by installing the Z switch. The switch goes on the side, all the components on the motherboard for the FOB2 go on the side that's outlined with a white on the silk screen. So on the Z, it goes on the front because the outline's on the front, and the trigger potentiometers go on the back because they're outlined there. If you mess this up, you'll have to desolder and start again, and it's really annoying. So don't, don't screw up. So now that the switch is installed, I'm going to take my iron, wipe the tip very nicely, add some fresh solder. and solder each pin. We've made significant enhancements on FOB2 for solderability. The uh, particularly ground planes are thermally isolated from the pins, so you don't need as powerful of a soldering iron to solder. At this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a toothpick to scrape away at the flux in between these, loosen it up. The no clean flux leaves a very gummy residue that is hard to clean on its own. And then I'll use a cotton swab to wipe away the flux. On to the, the trigger potentiometers. Since the motherboard's already upside down, I can just put them in there. And at this point, I will use masking tape to tape them to the back of the motherboard so that they are flush the whole time as I'm soldering them. Otherwise they'll start to fall out. Make sure they're flush, flip it over, and grab it in my voice. As far as holding the PCB, some people like to use PCB holders that grab onto the sides, but I like a vise because a vise is able to hold onto very small parts or strangely shaped parts like our C-Stick daughter board and the trigger daughter boards. And the vise is great because you can hold things at any angle and it holds it very rigidly so I can push very hard without it letting go. Additionally, it's less likely to knock components off the very edges of the boards. For now, though, I will just keep soldering. When using a soldering iron, it's very important to have a, an iron that controls its temperature via some sort of uh, active feedback mechanism. Uh, when a soldering iron is uncontrolled, it gets too cold when you're using it too much and too hot when you're not using it. And when it's too hot, you'll burn the board, and when it's too cold, it takes too long to solder, and you'll counterintuitively also burn the board. Our temperature-controlled iron, as soon as you touch it, will start pumping more power in, and so it heats the board fast enough, but then doesn't overheat it. And this makes soldering so much better, so much easier, and you'll have uh, fewer burned boards. Note that this is not the same thing as a a board as a soldering iron that has a temperature controlled dial that doesn't have feedback because those just change the fixed power output and have the same issues. Now that I've soldered these trigger potentiometers, I'll take the tape off and I will clean the flux off of the solder joints. It's particularly important on the right side here because this flux can get onto the button pads, which will reduce the reliable, reliability of ABXY. I'm gonna refill these to fully cover the gold. If you do choose to use uh, a solder that uses normal flux, oh, one of my lights went. Uh, 
uh, then you'll have to uh, clean it or else the controller just might not work or work unreliably. Uh, that's because normal flux, not I call it yes clean flux, um, leaves a conductive residue and the residue can interfere in the performance of the controller. Now that I've cleaned the flux off of these, I'll do a little better job on this one. Next, I will do the C stick. So, when you're doing individual wires, I like to fill up all the holes, melt the hole, insert the wire, remove the iron. Uh, but for the C stick cables that come pre uh, the ribbon cables, I'll only do that on a single hole. So in this case, I like to do it on one of the middle holes. I insert the solder. I melt the solder in. I clean the flux off the back. Next, I take the ribbon, melt it, and insert the cable. Now the cable is in place, I can easily solder the other pins on the cable. Now I'll clean the flux off with a toothpick and a cotton, cotton swab. Looks like I'm out of alcohol in here. Let me just refill this quickly. Now I will attach it to the motherboard. It is very important to make sure that it's attached in the correct orientation. You want the both to be upright in this orientation and then you rotate it like this so that the uh, club end of the motherboard of the C-stick daughter board faces inside. This is wrong and this is right. The other way to see is that the uh, pads here are the rightmost on the connector side. Uh, come on, focus. The one on this side that I have the red wire on the cable is a uh, square pad that indicates the ground. Let me clean this better. You always want the square pad on the daughter board to go to the square pad on the motherboard. So right now I will put it in place and begin soldering these.
Now that they're soldered, I will clean them. These, should, these connections on the C-stick, you should be very careful not to short. If you short these, then both the analog stick and the C-stick won't work. They are connected via the same bus, and only one of these pins selects which one is being read at a time. So if you short them, they both stop working. If you have a broken connection, only the C-stick won't work in that case. Um, now you bend it under, like this. It should look like this from the side, and that is how you put the C-stick in place. Next, I'll move on to the trigger daughter boards, which I will first install wires in. First, I'm going to fill the holes with solder. I will clean off the flux on the back. The flux comes inside the core of the solder, so it won't come from the iron side, but it doesn't really hurt to clean the iron side of these. Next, I will take the four wires and solder them into the holes. I like to line up the wires like this, and then I can, one by one, Melt the hole, insert the pretend of the wire, pretend end of the wire, and let go. Insert it, let it cool, let go. Insert it, cool, let go. Heat it, insert it, cool, and let go. Next, on the motherboard, I'm just going to do a little prep work for later steps. I'm going to pre-tin the pads for the rumble motors, and I will also pre-tin the fob vision pin holes. The fob vision pin holes, however, need to be cleaned out, so I will desolder them. This just makes it significantly easy, easier to solder the wires in later. And now those need cleaning. Okay, so now our glue has cured on the stick boxes. Make sure that the stick box is free to move, and I will insert the stick boxes. This is because once to install the trigger paddles, you need to install the rumble bracket, and the rumble bracket unfortunately covers one of the stick box screws, so I will put the stick boxes on. Make sure that the magnets on the stick boxes are on the south and east side of the motherboard. Uh, southeast in this orientation. This ensures that they are over the Hall effect sensors that actually read the position of the magnets. And now I will 
will screw these on. It can be good to use Loctite if these do not like to stay tight because stick box security is very important on a fob. If the stick box moves a little, then your calibration will be disturbed. At the same time, do not over tighten them or you'll just strip the plastic. Fortunately, the stick box seems to be gripping very well. Some, some ones, even new, will like to turn and then back out a little. Uh, for those ones, you definitely want to use thread locker. Preferably the, the kind that's removable, like the purple. This one's liking to back out, so I'm pushing a little farther. There we go. Now it's secure. And next, I will insert the trigger paddles with the wires into the uh, rumble bracket that holds the trigger paddles. Insert the paddle, bend the wires through the slot in the back, and bend them around. Then you place it on the motherboard, make sure that it's not interfering with the C-stick, and then place the wires in the holes that are labeled L and R. It does not matter which wire goes in which hole for L and R, even though on the motherboard one is square and one is round. This is just a switch and it doesn't matter what, which one is connected to plus and which one is connected to ground. And now, I like to use a clothespin or similar clip to hold the rumble bracket in place while I solder on top of the motherboard to connect the wires to the motherboard. So now I'll solder here. One thing I forgot to mention is that you always want to flash the firmware onto the motherboard before you begin all of this in order to make sure that it's functioning and you don't do all this work on a dead motherboard. Usually what happens when, when a motherboard is dead is the very, very, very fine soldering around the pins on the microcontroller uh, can be bridged. If you are looking at the microcontroller, the one in the center and the top on the left side, those ones sometimes bridge anyway, but those are internally connected, so it doesn't matter. But you definitely want to make sure that none of the others are connected. If you have any questions, come see the FOB Discord and people will assist you if you have a dead board. That's not very common though, especially if you go with Elecro to build your boards, although JLC has uh, suffered in quality lately. Clean the flux off. Now, at this point, I will be doing an optional step, which is very important if you want uh, FOB Vision, which is a feature unique to the FOB2 that lets you graphically configure your controller. Although first, I'll be doing some preventive, preventative trigger maintenance, which will help prevent trigger jams. Um, on these, on GameCube controllers, this little corner here can get uh, stuck on the tab of the trigger. And so we cut just a millimeter or two of this tab off and that prevents the problem from occurring. Additionally, for this customer, I will be uh, installing a trigger plug in R.
Now I'll reinstall the trigger guard and these screws. This side doesn't need a plug, however, I will be doing the preventative maintenance on the shell. Next, I will be installing a, drilling a hole to install fob vision. So you need to drill the hole centered on this uh, pin, one half of an inch or 13 millimeters downward from the edge of the shell. I do this freehand, but if it's your first time, I suggest you measure it. It's very good to use a split point bit because it won't wander as you're drilling in. Start slow, and then speed up, apply pressure gently, and you'll drill a hole. Next, you have to clean up this rib, at least on T3 shells. On a T2 or T1 shell, these ribs won't be there, and this rib won't be there, so you don't have to do this step. If you don't remove this rib, then the jack for fob vision will not fit. That's all you'll do with the back shell for now. Now set it aside. Next we'll be preparing these wires. With these wires you want to take a uh, JST-PH 2.0 and cut it so that the wires are three and a half inches long from the back of the connector and then these wires you want to be one and a half inches long from tip to tip of the wire. Next, you want to strip these very short. Do not leave a lot of excess. We don't want, we simultaneously don't want too much slack, but we don't want it to be short or else it won't fit. Strip and twist. Strip and twist. Strip and twist, and then strip and twist. Next, flex these and then apply solder. Add flux to the end. Flux to the end and tin it. Add flux and tin it. And now clean the flux off. Additionally on this, we will, so now 
I will take the Fog Vision Jack and using needle nose pliers, I will curl up this side piece and bend the end piece, the end connectors to be perpendicular to the barrel. We will not use this gold colored connector, but we will use these two silver ones. This one will be connected to ground and this will be connected to positive or signal. Um, so now I will flux the two ones that we will be using and I will pretend them. That's a lot. I will use a toothpick to redistribute. That's 10. Yeah, that one's 10 to some extent. Next, I will uh, clean the flux off because that was a lot of flux. and I'll start heating a hot glue gun, which we'll be using later. Um, now, I will put uh, three bits of short pieces of heat shrink tubing over this. These will be used to bundle the wires later to keep them neat, but for now, just put them down at the bottom and ignore them. And then now, I will solder these wires, which were pre-tinned, remember. Uh, solder them to these uh, tabs on the back of the three and a half millimeter Bob Vision Jack. At this point, I will distribute these over here and I will shrink them using my heat gun off camera. Back on camera, we will clamp the JST socket together with the plug in here, tin these pins on the plug, and solder the ends of these very short one and a half inch wires to the pins of the jack of the JST. Next, I will take hot glue and reinforce this. This is just used as a strain relief for these wires so that these solder connections don't break when you open the controller. side here. And next I will install the rumble wire, the rumble motor. Because of the close proximity of the rumble motor wires to the fob vision holes, uh, we have to solder this in first. Simply take the wire and melt the pool of solder that was already there and hold it in place. 
Super easy. Now we take this. And remember, I pre-tinned the holes for fob vision. I will grab the motherboard and device. Insert the file vision wires. Make sure that you have black to black, red to red. Black goes to the center pin and red goes to the side pin and that the gold pin is unused. Uh, if you don't follow this convention, then it won't work. Next, you put the black in the square pin and uh, red in the round pin with the box on it. What I'll do here is I will insert these and just let it sit in place while I tin the iron and transfer solder to this. Because both the pin, both the wire and the hole are pre-tinned, the so the solder will just wick in naturally. And then you can finish it off with just a little extra. For good measure. Next here comes the delicate part. Um, take your hot glue gun. Put a dot right here. That will be used to hold the wires down as they're routed around. And then now that those are down, we'll apply a little, a big blob of hot glue under the wires and a little bit on the back here and glue this in place at an angle, like so. It's very important to fill from the pins all the way to the bottom of the rumble bracket. Otherwise, when you insert the JST, it pushes the pins down and the pins can pop out of the back of the plug. The other thing to keep in mind is don't let it get too tall, like in the current orientation you don't want to get too far from the rumble motor or else it will not fit into the shell. Um, let's cut off the stray strands of hot glue, turn off the hot glue gun. this stray strand and at this point I will start I will remove let us let it cool a bit more and in fact I'll apply a little more on the side So now I've removed this, and now we go back to the back shell. I figured out a new routing for this. You take the connector and you give it a squiggly orientation like this. So 
you want it to go, if the jack is here, you want the wire to go up next to this divider and then back down and back up again. I will hold it a little tighter and show you how it turns out. Give this one a crisp fold here and give this one a crisp fold here. And insert it into the hole and then attach it with the nut. You can tighten the nut using a 10 millimeter driver and I use some strong needle nose pliers to grab the silver part of the jack and socket to tighten it. Now, as you can see, this ensures that the wires are kept together even as you remove or insert it and it keeps them on the side of the rumble motor. Uh, that was terrible. Now that you can see it, the wires stay along the side of this divider and out of the way of the rumble motor. The final step to installing, to assembling the fob is putting the cable in. On the fob 2, we labeled it for you. It says blue wire on the left. We want the blue wire on the left. Um, blue wire on the left for OEM cables. If you use a third party cable, you're on your own. Figure it out. So now I'm putting the cable assembly in here and soldering it. One thing to note is that on disconnectable JSTs, this can be way too tall for fob vision to fit, and so it's best to use a non-disconnectable board-in connector. So if you have a power cord, you can use a Molex 50034-8000 pins and a Molex 51015-0600 board-in connector, and that will let you replace the connector with a low profile fixed one. It'll be more reliable because you won't have the disconnection uh, contacts and you can audit the quality of the crimps yourself. But for now, I'm just using the OEM cable because they are very reliable. And now I'll clean the flex off. Now I will take the stick caps, reinstall them. Don't forget this step, it's very annoying when you put your fob back together and you forgot the stick caps. Insert it in the top shell. Make sure these sliders are all the way towards the, the cable side of the controller. Make sure the cable lies flat, is tucked around the loop, and is sitting neatly in the cable hole. Now, what I'll do is I'll take the fob vision connection from the back shell, plug it in, and then see how it goes together. Make sure everything sits flat.
and then screw it together. On a Bob Vision build, the screw on the Nintendo side, the D-pad side, will be probably the hardest one to go together. But everything else should go together very easily. And that's it, a complete FaVision 2.0 build from start to finish.